Hey, what's up, y'all? This is Tony A with Your Body. So I have a special guest on the channel, Chinyere. And she's special because she's a Nigerian sister that actually inherited her father's business. Yes. So, okay. So I just want to bring her on so she can talk about her, her own experience, just running a business, having employees, and all of that good stuff. So as you know, this channel is just to talk about business topics. So here we have a business owner and definitely want to learn a little bit more about you and, and possibly the audience can, you know, just grab some, some nuggets from what you say today. So how are you doing today? I am well. Thank you for having me on the channel. How are you? I'm oh, doing pretty good. good. So, all right. So we never really, I never really talked too much about your background. So can you kind of just explain like where you coming from? Where you born here? Born in Nigeria? And just get up again and yeah, definitely. So I was born here. I was actually born in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And I have been in uh, this area where I'm currently at my entire life. My parents are originally from uh, the southeastern part of Nigeria. Uh, my father's from Imo State. My mother's from Abia State. And they actually met while they were students at Howard University. Um, and so they got married and then, of course, had us and we will, we, you know, we grew up here. Uh, and for many years, my father was a physician by trade. Uh, my mother was in finances and accounting. And <clears throat> uh, my father, you know, I think this is something that uh, tends to be uh, pretty normal when it comes to Igbo culture is, is this drive for entrepreneurship and uh, wealth building and creating wealth. And so yeah. my father, like, Many of his compatriots that you know really took that to heart, and even as a physician, uh, he was self-employed, ran his own practice for many years, um, and did quite well until there were some shifts in uh, the medical industry, particularly with regards to insurance, where um, he felt like it would be better to proceed in a different direction, and he was really thinking about something that he could pass out to us and and leave to us. And uh, funnily enough. Uh, I think only my sister kind of expressed an interest in medicine, but uh, I think he felt that it would be better if he could set us up with something um, outside of a medical practice. So that's when he segued into construction, which I know was kind of random. Uh, but there were some of his, you know, some of his uh, uh, friends and a couple relatives who uh, were in the industry and, and uh, not even really so much construction, but facilities maintenance. And they were doing well, at least locally in the uh, district. And so he saw a, a very special opportunity. And so founded the company, excuse me, founded the company, which is uh, called JJPS Inc. in 2004. And so that stands for Joseph Jantorial and Professional Services. Joseph is the anglicized name for uh, my grandfather. Okay. Um, and so... I was in high school when the company was founded. Um, and interestingly enough about me, I study, I went to school to study political science. I have a master in public administration as well. Wanted to be on the government side, but um, while I was probably in my early to mid twenties trying to figure out kind of myself and really what I want to do and how I want to kind of leave my mark um, in the community, I came on board to help my dad uh, learn the business. And over time I found it was something I found to actually enjoy. Um, not so much the technical aspect of uh, what we provide when it comes to construction, which is like interior demolition and has this materials abatement, but running a business, uh, you know, being visible in the community, creating jobs, uh, you know, formulating and keeping those relationships, setting strat strategies in order to grow the business. And so I've been with the company in an official capacity for nine years now. And I have been serving as the president uh, for three. So it, it's been an exciting journey. Okay. So just going back to, you said you was in high school and you were studying political or you was going to college for political science. Yes. So even in high school, did I guess you already knew that your father was setting you up to maybe have a piece of the company or? Yes. yes. Okay. So, but at the same time, you still wasn't sure what you want to do in life. Right. And, and so it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, like many young people, I think it changed a million times, you know, so at first I want to be a lawyer. And I think us as Nigerians, we know there's that whole pressure from your parents, you so doctor, lawyer, 
or engineer. And I want to be a lawyer. I particularly want to be a criminal defense attorney. Um, I had done a lot of research with like the Innocence Project and, and, and things like that when I was in high school. And so that's why I went to go study political science. And also too, I do, you know, I like history. Um, I'm an avid uh, observer of politics even now and, and governance. And so that type of stuff did interest me. Um, and I, I went to Hampton University, studied political, scho- uh, political science on a basketball scholarship. So I was also playing basketball uh, while studying poli sci. And I did want to play professionally for a little bit, but that was never the end all be all for me. It was ultimately that I was going to go to law school, earn my JD, and then become a practicing attorney. Um, and so while I was playing pro, um, I think my second year, I, I lived in Poland for two years and I was playing on a professional team there. I kind of got the revelation that, hey, I probably really don't want to go to law school. You know, I'm very interested in governance and in city administration, and um, I can do what I what I think I want to do with a, um, an MPA and not take on as much law school debt. So that became the next goal. And when I came back and finished my career, um, I went to grad school while coming into the business. And so we had known from the beginning that. Uh, you know, our father had set this up to be a part of our inheritance, but it wasn't something that I necessarily saw myself being involved in day to day. Um, you know, maybe at most having an advisory role as someone who was a board member, someone who was going to inherit shares, but it was never something that I saw myself involved with intimately for an extended amount of time. Um, and so it, it, it did end up happening when I came, you know, came back and was in grad school and then walked into that opportunity. So, okay, so after that long journey, college, and then you said your, your graduate year, you was-, you was Graduate becoming, school. Okay, graduate school, that's when you was becoming uh, the president, or I guess the CEO of the company. So when I was in grad school, uh, my official title was chief administrative officer. And so my role was to oversee the administrative and day-to-day operations okay. of the business. So I really wasn't that involved with the technical side. Yes. Okay. I was going to say while in grad school. Maybe. In grad school. And, and, and let me put this out there. Let me put there. It was on a part-time basis. So <laughs> I would say I probably wasn't giving the company more than like 10 hours a week max because- Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. school I mean you already know it's a different animal but one thing I will say that's interesting is that um, with the degree I studied in the program I did it at which is George Mason University um, they have one of their concentrations that fo- focuses on uh, relationships between the public and private sector in order to get government you know government done and so it was interesting I was actually able to apply what I was learning in real time to the business because we're a government contractor. We sell our business, you know, we sell our services primarily to government agencies. And, um, you know, it's important to have a presence in the community because you're literally procuring these services to the government and by extension taxpayers. And so it was kind of cool to be in grad school at that time and, and be able to kind of have something at least on the practical side where I could observe some of the theory and apply it in a meaningful way. So when, when, I guess, at what point did your role switch from being the chief administrative officer to like- The president. Right. Yeah, so that took place early 2018. Um, You know, my father, uh, as you know, he got older as all of our parents do, we started talking more about, you know, the the line of succession and being able to uh, prepare it so that it could be passed down and, and, and continued. And I think my dad was getting to a place to where, you know, he just wanted to, he's still very much involved with the company, but again, was just forward thinking about the next generation. Um, and so he's, he, you know, was, was at the place where he was nearing retirement. And um, we had the conversation within the family and felt like I, I was in the best position to take it over just due to the knowledge I had as well as the experience. Um, and so, that was a conversation and something that happened ultimately about three years ago. So, um, you know, it was about a good six years of experience that I was able to glean on before taking it over um, in a full capacity. Okay. So, um, so I, I think I already told you, I, I created my own business um, in real estate before, mm-hmm. and now I'm working on my second business. And a lot of what I'm doing for the second business is, 
uh, structuring it so that it's actually a business instead of a job. So just from my experience, just being honest, I've seen a lot of Nigerian businesses, African businesses where they're not really running as um, a business as far as like systems and right. everything in place. So how was it when you were coming into your your dad's business? Did he, was he different? With did, Like, did he have like protocol principles, everything set up? Or was it like you kind of had a, you know, yeah and, and yeah um in all honesty <laughs> no <laughs> no it was very much a uh one-man show when I came in and um some of that could be cultural I think also a lot of that was attributed to oh, yeah. um you know in the past he had been burned before just to be honest he had been burned and so there was an issue with uh you know, trusting and being able to, to properly delegate things. Because again, that just goes back to trust. And unfortunately in business, you know, that that's that's a risk that, that's inherent, that's there. That, you know, you set these systems up in place, you delegate roles to people you don't want to micromanage, you trust them to execute and when they don't, it falls down, it falls back on you, right? So that that's something that's very much a part of it. But um, to answer your question, when I came in there, you know, there were no systems in place and, and even worse, a lot of the knowledge was right here in his head. And so we had to go through that process of being able to put, uh, first of all, implement a structure that would, uh, that was conducive to operational efficiency. We had to get a lot of the knowledge and make sure that it was put on paper. I mean, things as simple as creating a policy and procedures manual, yeah. you know, mapping out uh, just so that we could visualize it. Uh, some type of structure, whether it was a, a hierarchical structure or more of like a, a fluid organic type of um, operation system. Um, with, with us, it, it tends to be a bit more hi hierarchical, but there's some flexibility there. And we've just found that's a, a management style that works for us. But, you know, putting these things on paper, um, you know, having the internal employees, and even those in the field, uh, trained on some of the processes, trained on how we do certain things so that, you know, excuse me, I'm sorry, so that I can, you know, if, if it has to be, if I, I can be in the gym at 10 o'clock a.m. working out and my business is running and I'm not, you know, by the computer literally working like it's a job, you know? So it's about, so I'm, I'm reading a series of books right now and it's all about business and it's, it's for this business that I'm creating right now. And basically it it's teaching one, how to create a business to sell it. Now, that's one of the goals I want to do is sell the business. But what I like about the, the content that's in the book is, you know, you have to have a goal in mind when you're starting out and then you have to put systems in place so that you are not the business. So right. that if something happens to you, things are still going to be operating and it's for your own sanity. So my first business, uh, home inspection business, I was the business, just like what your dad is doing. It's so common amongst us, at least in, in our community, that we're not thinking about delegating and we're not thinking about having it run like a machine. Mm -hmm. so, what I'm learning from these books is, no, you don't have to, you shouldn't be doing the day-to-day -day operation. You should check it, check in on it. Maybe right. get some reports, have your people in line so that they report to you. But you created this thing you put the um the systems in place. You got the processes, the organizational chart, the 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 goal of the company, where where the company is trying to go, the vision, and you you sit back and you let it run, and that's that's what your business is, so that you can continue to pass it down or do whatever with it. So uh, I was just curious about that, just because I know my experience, I know the experience of a lot of other people that try to get into business. And I think it's a really important thing, at least in our community that, hey, it's not just about you, it's about your team. And you want things operating so that you can have that flexibility, say with your family, your own personal life. And you know, everyone is happy as well. If, if everyone knows what they're supposed to do, it's consistent. And then your customers can benefit off of that as well. 
Right. And it's, it's also, you know, that also enables growth because if you are the one man band, if you're doing everything, you can't be the one that's focused on business development. You can't, which is what I'm doing now. You know, you, you can't be the one that's looking onto the next thing for new opportunities. That's establishing new relationships that, they, that can become potential customers because you're too busy working on payroll. You're too busy putting these compliance reports together. You're too busy doing all this other stuff. So, you know, I don't know if part of it is kind of a mentality we have in our culture where we don't like to, we become really like attached to our wealth or we become really attached to things that we create. I mean, yeah. I don't think you could, you could ask any Nigerian who starts a business, hey, did you ever, are you creating this to sell it? Or is, is acquisition something that you would think about? They would tell you, what? So what? No, you know, even though that can become something that's more profitable. Well, you know what, because it, it is cultural because we look at it as, employees and we just know to work just work hard just work i mean that's what our, a lot of our parents did when they when they first came over here that's all they did was just work they weren't trained on hey you don't work in the business you're supposed to be working on it so right. that you can like you're saying look for growth look for other um potential if, i also think it's a lot of ego and pride just to say hey this is me this is this is what i got when I was in Nigeria, I'm sure you experienced it too, where it's you, 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 usually you know who the owner is because they're, they're, they're walking around and, and it's just like, they're not as efficient because I'm looking at other industries and other businesses, uh, Amazon, let's just say, let's just pick right. the biggest one. And it's just like the way that they operate is so efficient. And you know, you know, um, Jeff Bezos is, is not on the, in the front lines doing all this stuff he got everything in place and everything's working efficiently and money is just generating on top of itself and you know so i think that's uh definitely um uh some skills that we need to look at and that's what i'm doing for myself with the second business so that i had that flexibility to do whatever the hell i want to want to do and i got my team working and i can keep right. on. and then when i'm ready to you know just release it take that money and, and put it in the next the next venture. So right. I, I guess, so you're saying it wasn't really set up that way. How were the employees accepting you um, when you first came in? I guess they already know that you was the daughter. So mm. they had respect for you regardless. Right. But, I mean, were they, was the training process very frustrating or were they kind of like, you know, like- So, um, you know, it, it, they were very respectful. Um, sometimes there was kind of a, kind of a struggle because, you know, again, when I came in, I was very young. I was like 24, 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And you had some of these employees who were my father's age, some were older. And while they were respectful, um, you know, I could tell they kind of looked at me as like a little girl. You know, so I had to kind of earn their respect. And some of that was me as well. Um, I didn't have the confidence and assertiveness I needed. And that was something that was built with time mm -hmm. uh, because I just was not as knowledgeable about, you know, the technical side of it and even contracting. Like I was asking them questions. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And I, I mean, I did have to pull back from it because there was another side of it where you had some of the employees where they're like, Ooh, okay, we can take advantage of her because you don't know what's going on, you know? Um, but for the most part, those are just kind of like the growing pains and the bumps in the road that uh, we found ways to navigate around eventually. I think that for us and, and for me in particular, um, one of the things that I found, and this you could say this for any business, is it's, it's made by the people. You know, it's all about people. Your customers are people, then the, your internal employees, they're people. And if you cultivate those relationships and, you know, you treat them with integrity and dignity over time, um, you'll find that there's more of a process for teamwork versus trying to undermine people. And, and you'll be able to weed the bad ones out. Um, and that was something that I experienced um, over the six, seven years before I did take over as the president. Um, so that kind of, you know, that kind of was um, my experience when it came to the training was, aside from those few things I mentioned, it, it, it got to be more of a collaborative effort. and. Um, it's it's actually been very beneficial because the senior employees that we have now that coordinate our field operations, we're very much a team. You know, we're very much a team and we're able to hold each other down. 
Um, I think I told you at the beginning of this year, I took a seven day vacation to Hawaii. Right, yeah. um, you know, I was doing some work from Hawaii, but I wasn't. Oh, <laughs> you saw pictures, yeah. <laughs> everything ran smoothly. You know, my my field directors had everything going well. The team was working, um, and 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 part of that system being work so well it didn't just happen overnight it wasn't like hey okay we just drew it out on paper we implemented it and that was it but it came from you know seven eight years of working to learn and, and to grow the company together and to put things in place to make things more efficient um, as a team so that's been my experience again I know people's may be a little bit different but that's just kind of my perspective yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, ask you for some some tips as I'm building my my own because that's that's what I'm reading and is just I just know from my own mistakes what I did wrong with my first business and I'm not trying to repeat it again. So let me ask you this question: What would you say is the biggest mistake you made so far when you came into the company, and then kind of like your biggest learning ex, um, uh, experience? Um, I, so I would say for me, the biggest mistake I made, and I, I think I attribute some of this to youth and then some of this to my personality as well, was treating some of the employees and even some of our customers as if they were friends. And yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. And um, I mean, if you've been working for someone for a very long time and they become like family that's fine, but that's not something, you know, you don't come in and kind of like have that type of dynamic. And I think for me, it was like, okay, you know, they're people like just want to be cool, laid back. But if you do that, you know, it'll go back to, again, where you're having people take advantage of you, you try to put the, your foot down, they're not taking you seriously. Um, you know, a customer that maybe they're not able to get a quote right when they want it. You think, okay, they're, they're going to let it go. Oh, they're, they're calling my dad and saying, oh, gee, you're at da, 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 da. And then I'm here in the third degree. Um, oh, wow. So I think for me, the biggest thing, the biggest mistake was uh, the disposition I had early on. And so now I've made that adjustment to where it's very much business first. And that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm walking around like some tyrant or some antisocial person when it comes to the customers, you know, um, I'm, again, I, emotional intelligence is a very big part of running a business and running a successful business, but understanding, hey, there's a job to be done. There's certain lines and boundaries that are not to be crossed. When it comes to money, nobody is your friend, you know, it's just about you, you handle your business, you treat people with dignity and respect, but you focus on the bottom line. And, um, that was probably one of the biggest mistakes I made. I would also say another one was I did not do enough, at least initially, I did not do enough asking of why. I didn't do enough, um, you know, if I was told to do something, if my dad said he would do something like this, I would just do it. And I think that comes from, that again, comes from our culture. Because yeah, I, think no, I was going to say. You know, <laughs> sometimes you, you talk, you say, well, why? They think you're being just. Dist- they yeah, think you're being disrespectful, you, you know? And and it's like, no, 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 mom. Like, if it's in the home, okay. But yeah. in, in, in business, it's very important to understand the reasoning and the processes behind certain things so that not only as the owner, the leader, you understand when to better implement them, but that also provides opportunities for innovation if you understand why we do things a certain way. That, op- that provides opportunities for improvement. And so as I've gotten older and... Uh, um, you know, I've, I've kind of really grown into that. I've learned to ask those questions. I asked those questions to my dad and, and saw, okay, well, the reason we're doing something like this is, is not because it's so beneficial or even it's required by the District of Columbia, but it's because, you know, this is something that was done in like 1993 and it was very successful. And, you know, sometimes, especially when it comes to like a different generation, they may just know how to do one thing one way, right? So, um, and that's, you know, Please, I'm not throwing my father under the bus at all. I mean, my dad, I have the utmost respect. Very, very few yeah, people. I think we understand. Yeah, I would say I mean, on the I, planet, I think there, there are very few people that could do what he did. But the audience understands we're all Africans. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying that's probably one of the biggest mistakes I would say as well. It's not asking that question why enough and trying to gain an understanding. Mm, okay. So I guess 
if you can, so say there's somebody um, with the whole last year, a lot of people was looking at entrepreneurship as an option just for freedom and just more security financially. So you got a lot of people that's trying to go into the space of just owning businesses. What will be the single most important piece of information you would give them starting out? If they want to like, just start a business, what, what would you say is the most important thing to focus on? Or things? Um, That's a really good question. Um, I think I would say that number one, understand, well, not even does the most important thing, understand how important relationships are when it comes to your business. So understand how to properly cultivate relationships and how to maintain them. Cultivate, maintain them, and then even grow them. Uh, because in any business, whether it's uh, you know, in, in the construction or home improvement industry, or it's, you know, in, in, in a service industry, so like beauty, um, you know, selling, what have you, relationships are going to make your world go round. Networking is going to make your world go round. A lot of the opportunities that we're invited to bid on and, and that we're, we're asked to go to, to do work on, it doesn't come from things that are advertised through a, um, you know, a government solicitation page, right? It's, the project managers know us and they've worked with us before and they know our, our, our workmanship. So they call us. And these are relationships that we have taken more than a decade building by just, you know, it's kind of hard in the COVID setting, but, uh, setting excuse me, but by just going to different places, showing our faces, networking. Um, and, and then again, like checking in, building those relationships over time. A lot of people, when they hear the, the phrase networking, they think they're going to show up to one event and they'll leave out with a contract or they'll leave out with a job or, you know, they'll leave out with a whole new set of customers. And it doesn't work that way. Um, but I would say, you know, understanding relationships and how they, they work in really growing a business. And if you can do anything to kind of start to establish relationships that could become a potential client base before you launch your business, that, that's great. But if not, you know, that's fine. Nothing is ever going to be ideal before you take that next leap of faith. But I would say uh, relationship is super important. Mm -hmm. So of course, the other side of that is, you know, you don't want to do what, you don't want to be this person that's just destroying relationships and you're arrogant and you just don't, you know, you're not willing to listen to people either because that's going to hurt you um, in the long run as well. Mm, okay. Well, uh, definitely let the, the audience know once again, your company and your, you do work only in DC or just the DMV area? So we are based in the DMV area. We do work. Our company, name company name is Company name is JJPS. Inc. Our website is jjpsconstruction.com. Uh, we provide interior demolition, hazardous materials abatement, and facilities maintenance services. We are based in Washington, D.C., and our service area um, stretches from Northern Virginia through the city all the way into Southern Maryland. Okay. Um, I'm definitely going to put your, your contact information, uh, the website up um, in okay. the video. And then if if anyone needs some, some services, then they can definitely contact uh, your company. Yes, let me put one last thing out there. Cool. And I'm glad you said that because we only provide services to commercial and institutional customers. So we do not do residential. Oh, uh, yeah. And we do not do residential. So you must have had a lot of inquiries. Like, hey, can you oh, my gosh. And I, I feel so bad. I feel so bad bad but just in the district alone the compliance for residential abatements is arts and so that goes back again to one of the efficiency things that we talked about um, you got cut up a little bit you said the requirements in dc are what off the charts the compliance when it comes to removing and mitigating hazardous materials the administrative burden uh, in many times ends up being more than the project itself Right. So the amount of time you're spending to pay an employee to file a permit, get all the paperwork together, gather the contracts, you know, have the specifications. And you can only charge so much to be competitive in the residential market. It's not even worth it. <laughs> the headache just isn't too much. So I'm sure there are residential companies, but for us, when we're dealing with larger properties in the commercial space and the institutional space, it just doesn't make sense from an operational standpoint um, to offer that service. So, you know, we don't. Okay. 
All right, well, got your, I'm going to put your contact information up there for whoever uh, needs your services. And uh, once again, I appreciate you coming and just talking with us, sharing some some of your experiences. And hopefully to, to you all that's watching, this is very beneficial. Leave your comments down below if you have something to say. Do you, any last words? Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And for those of us out there who are aspiring entrepreneurs, look, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So don't be afraid. What you have to lose, just go for it. Yeah, get, get people thinking. I got that. I, I got <laughs> All right, y'all. Um, catch me in the next video coming soon. Y'all stay blessed.